I want to invite Joseph uh, to dive down on this diagram that Nils showed about co-creation. In my experience, we're often working in quite the opposite extremes of co-creation. We're either saying, I am the local government, I'm trying to get people involved, come join my process, come put dots on my map, uh, which is not necessarily bad. Or in the other extreme, saying, you know, government is not doing anything for me. We have to take matters into our own hands. Uh, and we have to organize ourselves without or in spite of local government. Co-creation is saying something different. It's saying we have to combine those two approaches. Uh, so Joseph will tell us a little bit about his work in Kenya. Uh, you grew up in, in Kibera, one of the largest slums of Nairobi, and you've been involved with the Slum Dwellers Federation since 98. For many years. For many years. Uh, not just in Kenya, but also traveling the world and trying to set up a global campaign of urban poverty fighters. So, please. Oh, thank you. Morning, everyone. Yeah. Morning. Yeah, uh, Rose was saying her first interaction with SDI. I thought probably I also mentioned something when I first uh, met Rose. I think it was 2002. Uh, I grew up in Kibera. Uh, my mother was working in a market, toy market, which is the biggest informal market uh, in Kibera. At that time, the market was facing a lot of evictions because toy market is around six acres, real prime, and uh, most of the plots are owned by very well connected individuals within the government. So we used to face a lot of evictions. So for us, I was a young man, very angry, activism, eh, and used to be fighting with the police and the government a lot. I met uh, Rose. Uh, I think they had come for the UN governing council, so they came to the market. And these people started talking about to, to us about daily savings, about uh, data collection, you need to get organized. And I asked these people, what kind of joke is this? <laughs> We're in the middle of a war and they are telling us to start saving. But then again, we started saving, we started organizing around the market, we started collecting information about ourselves. And we got everybody involved. So the next time Rose came, uh, our savings scheme had grown. I think we were around 3,000 traders. Uh, we are all more organized. We had started now talking to the city. We had at least managed to, uh, to because of our youth, we had managed to one of the private investors, to, uh, the private developers who wanted to take out the market. So our savings scheme grew. We started our own micro lending, so the market thrived. So the next time Rose came, I was also, I think I was the secretary of the market, and Rose said, Rose promised, and I think this is a habit that he acquired from joking. <laughs> so the next time I come, the person with the <coughs> highest savings, hmm, I'll make sure we get a house for him. So I said, yeah. Up to today, I'm still waiting for the house. <laughs> uh, but you got a toilet. Uh, but you got a toilet. <laughs> so I'll share with you about Mokuru. And I think most of you have never heard of Mokuru. Mokuru is a slum, which is uh, right in the middle of industrial area. And most of the people who live in Mokuru are the people who work in factories around uh, the industrial area. And I said before, uh, in Kibera, a lot of people have had Kibera because you think Kibera has been overstudied, overanalyzed. And the joke we have internally is that for every one family in Kibera, there is one NGO. <laughs> <laughs> and I think my friend uh, Joe from KDI, whom we collaborate with, uh, we have this debate on uh, <clears throat> between Kibera and Mukuru, which is more dense, which has more serious problems. So if you go to the government, the government tells you there are 250,000 residents in Kibera. But the NGOs will tell you there are 2 million people. But then again, so we usually say the truth is somewhere in between. Because if you go to Kibera in the evening when people are going to work, if you stand for 30 minutes, uh, you can count 250,000 people uh, just passing in that area. So we got involved in Mokuru uh, about uh, seven years ago in 2012, where the community was facing a lot of evictions. Then we started now understanding, because most of the communities were coming to us. Uh, Mungano, that is the federation in Kenya. We have a fund 
uh, that give livelihood loans uh, for people who also want to acquire. So they came to us, can you give us a loan of 60 million? Can you give us a loan of 100 million? And we asked why. Uh, the owner of the land has said that we are squatting on, has said we either pay or we get out. But after we had around uh, 12 communities coming, we said, I think this is getting serious. And we started now digging deeper and to understand who owns this land. So what we discovered within Mokuru is that uh, the land was dished out by the former president uh, just to consolidate power. And most of the people who owns these parcels of land, they are between two and a half acres to four acres. And most of them were former military generals, judges, uh, well-connected business people. And we knew this was, we had a fight in our hands. So we started organizing <laughs> communities and we, first of all, went to court. First of all, for the courts, we knew that we are not going to get, it's very hard for poor people to get justice in our courts of law. And we usually say there are two sets of law. There's one set of law that works for poor people and the other for rich people. And these people have got title for these parcels of land. So we started investigating and, and we, we, we also started to organize. So for us going to court, we knew the court would say, we will not say that, ah, no, you can't squat on that land. Forget about the owners. But we knew the courts are going to give us time to get organized. So we started organizing on the ground. We started collecting information. We started mapping out the area. And we started creating a resistance within Mokuru, uh, just for, so first of all, to fight these evictions. So that's, we are very successful on that end. We worked with the media. We worked with everybody. I think one of the biggest uh, media companies in Kenya did a one-week uh, series on who was Mokuru. And they started unmasking the people behind all these parcels of land. So we knew that uh, first of all we are addressing the tenure issues because most of the land in Nairobi, like the city of Nairobi, we are talking about 4 million people, we are talking about 2.5 living in formal settlements and of all the total land mass in Nairobi, poor people occupy just 1%, the 250, 2.5 million occupy less than 1% of the land. So what we did then was now to ask ourselves that uh, the same question that all Federation ask ourselves is the then what? We have collected this information, we have mapped all these areas, we have done the social mobilization, people are saving, so it was the then what? So five years ago, we started answering. Initially, it was just to address the tenure issues. But then again, uh, we looked at our laws, and now with the devolved system of government, where we have county governments under the jurisdiction of a governor. The county government have got powers within their laws that they can declare an area a special planning area. Initially, the Federation had done small projects in Kabimoto, where we had worked with the city to do small demonstration projects. We, have done, we had done 100 houses, 50 houses over there. So we pushed the city, we did research uh, on what are the challenges in Mokuru. This Mokuru is a place where there's no sanitation, there are no toilets. Uh, when it rains, it floods. And I think uh, some of you have been to Mokuru. Joe was there last week. Water gets up to this level. Children don't go to school. Then after the water goes down, uh, there are outbreaks of cholera. With all this information that we had, we pushed the county to declare Mokuru as a special planning area. And it took a lot of convincing to the then Nairobi City Cabinet on uh, who was in charge of uh, urban development. And they agreed eventually, and I think uh, last year in August, Mukuru was declared a special planning area. Then we had to ask ourselves, now that Mukuru has been declared a special planning area by the city, was to ask ourselves, so what? Uh, <laughs> the county has declared, so what? Then now we started answer, asking ourselves, what's the next level? So the next level, and we convince the city, we can work with you to produce a plan for Mukuru. Um, for us, at that time, we were just very confident, but we knew, uh, I told you the scale, Mukuru is 647 acres. We are talking about 100,000 families, 
100,000 households, so with a population of around between 400,000 to half a million people. And uh, for us, we are, we are thinking, are we biting more than we can chew? How do you move from building 100 houses in two years to start planning for 100,000 households? But the city agreed, and uh, we told them this is a city plan, but we are going to work with you uh, to produce a plan. The next thing the city said, but you know, we don't have the capacity to do this. This is something new to us. But we said, we can work with you. So we, as a federation, we realized that there are some things that we are very good at, collecting information, mapping, organizing, but then we realized there are other people with other expertise in other areas. So what the county did was to align with the strategic plan and to have different departments. We had one, the Department of Infrastructure, the Department of Finance, the Department of Health. So we aligned ourselves in those, uh, with the county's department. So we created consortiums under this. So we invited other institutions that are connected with the health, we invited civil society organizations that work on health. We invited civil societies that work on infrastructure. We invited civil societies that work on land. We invited civil societies that work on education. So we formed these consortiums. So the consortiums are headed by the directors of different departments, of different departments at the county level. So at the moment, the community mobilizing is ongoing. Every consortium is supposed to prepare a sector brief. Then we shall consolidate all these plans <coughs> by August next year. So we are hoping we'll have a plan for the city. So for us, this is the first time that uh, as a federation, we are doing this kind of thing with the city. And I think it has taken a lot of uh, negotiation, that has taken a lot of convincing for the city to, 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 to accept to work with slum dwellers. If you go to most of our informal settlements, uh, when the city is planning, when the city is allocating funds, allocating budgets, most of these areas do not get any allocations. The city tends to, the, 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 the city governments tend to, to, to allocate resources in nicer areas, they do roads, they do street lights. So for us, for the push, number one, for us to be visible, and for these informal settlements to be visible. So we are hoping and we, we are going to continue with these partnerships. So we are working yesterday when we are presenting in your offices. Most of the towns that you mentioned, uh, Kitui, we have federations there. We organize, we give them loans, we have mapped some of those areas. And I think that's one area we saw that we can work with. You. So the story of Mukuru, it's very long, it's seven years, it's more than seven years, and there have been a lot of engagement. So I think because of time, I have stopped there. <laughs> <laughs>